All right, hello and welcome to today's event, Science Live, Biodiesel Scientists Making an Impact. I'm Jenna Higgins-Rose and I've worked for the National Biodiesel Board for quite a few years now in various capacities. But one of the things I'm really proud to do for NBB is to manage our Student Scientist Professional Organization, the Next Generation Scientists for Biodiesel. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary of this program, which is, which is intended to foster professional relationships between young scientists and our more established scientists. It also shares accurate information and increases collaboration between academia and the biodiesel industry. It's largely funded by the United Soybean Board, so we thank them for their support and for being with us tonight. So we all find ourselves in an unusual and somewhat difficult time right now. We know from a survey of our NGSB members that the pandemic has impacted the research opportunities for many of the students with us tonight, just like it's impacted businesses and schools and virtually everyone else. But our hope is in the face of these challenges, the majority of people recognize that science has never been more important to us as a society. And science has also played a vital role in the development of biodiesel. Science is the reason we know that biodiesel reduces life cycle greenhouse gas emissions by up to 78%, even more according to some studies, making it the best liquid transportation fuel to help combat climate change. And science will continue to be extremely important. In fact, NBB has established a vision of 6 billion gallons of biomass-based diesel by 2030. Just to give you an idea, that would double the biodiesel industry's current production. That goal is attainable, but we will need scientists like the ones we'll meet today to get us there. And that's why I am so excited to introduce our four new co-chairs of the Next Generation Scientists for Biodiesel tonight. Their research and outreach activities have real world implications, including innovation, environmental solutions, and climate leadership. We will also hear from Floyd Vergara, a chemical engineer who became a climate expert in California. And now we're lucky enough to have him lead the National Biodiesel Board's West Coast office. Also, we'll hear from John Jansen of the United Soybean Board on exciting ways US soy is innovating. So just a little bit of housekeeping. If you want to ask a question, and we hope you do, please use your Q&A box on your Zoom panel and type it in. And please let us know who that question is directed at if you can. We also have two $100 gift cards we'll be giving away as prizes tonight. Here's how you can win. We'll have three quiz questions tonight, which you can answer from your Zoom panel. We will draw from those who get at least two out of three right, Hopefully by the end of the webinar, we'll be able to announce those winners. And if we have enough who get three out of three right, we might just draw from them. So let's test this out. Uh, the first question does not count in the drawing for the gift cards. We just wanna get an idea of who's with us tonight. So which category best describes you? A student or recent student interested in soybean or biodiesel outreach and research? Another scientist or technical expert? A biodiesel producer? or other industry, farmer, clean cities, which is a Department of Energy program that promotes alternative fuels, or maybe none of those categorizes you. So we'll give you just a minute to answer the poll. All right, and you can see we have a pretty good mix of people with us tonight. So we want to welcome everyone. Thank you for taking some time out of your day to be with us today. Before we dive into biodiesel tonight, we wanted to point out that although biodiesel can be made from just about any fat or vegetable oil, soybean oil is the most dominant feedstock. And soybean farmers really drove the inception of the biodiesel industry looking for a new outlet for excess soybean oil in the 1990s. So biodiesel itself is a key soy innovation, but it's one of many fascinating soybean innovations. We've invited John Jansen, the United Soybean Board's Vice President of Oil Strategy to give us a quick look. Hello, John. Hi, Jenna, thank you very much. 
Let me get this screen shared here. Hopefully everybody can see that and I can get this on full. Here we go. So the USB wants to commend our young scientists and engineers who you hear from today. The United Soybean Board is excited to continue the relationship built with the National Biodiesel Board and universities across the United States, doing great work to expand the use of clean burning biodiesel. And we certainly appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I manage the oil strategy component of the bean. Uh, my perspective is based on oil. My strength is a market understanding, knowing who and how customers use soybean oil, uh, and how to replace petroleum-based products is kind of important in, in what we do today, as far as uh, kicking out that bad petroleum and moving in with a vegetable oil input. Our strategy at the USB has changed over the last couple of years. Our focus has turned kind of a from a shotgun approach to where we're really working on six or seven main platforms. Our perspective is driven by a 10 to 15 year outlook that indicates that meal growth will continue driven by protein demand and placement of oil will continue to be an important driver to sustainability and greenhouse gas reduction. In many ways, uh, oil has become more important to the value chain and the projects that help disappear oil are crucial to farmer profitability long-term. In fiscal 2021, the USB kind of works on roughly 170 projects. The chart up shows the key areas the USB funds. The checkoff is invested significantly in creating demand for industrial uses of conventional soy, high oleic soy, and promoting sustainable production practices. As you can see here, technology and infrastructure are crucial parts of our long range strategic plan and center to the profitability of soy in the future. Now that I've told you a little bit about the checkoff's work, I'd like to talk about a few specific areas of investment where checkoff dollars are being spent to promote new industrial uses for that soybean oil. The checkoff invests in Research that investigates new ways to use soybean oil. Every year, the checkoff partners with academia and industry on roughly 30 to 40 projects that target industrial ap applications specifically. The oil being used uh, such as, is such a versatile ingredient that projects have really a wide range of potential applications and industrial applications and, and products that they can use, be used on. The checkoff looks to invest in high volume applications that have the potential to use the most oil, clearly. Uh, some of those include biodiesel, bioheat, rubber, adhesives, lubricants, asphalt, and surfactants. So let's take a, a little bit of a deeper dive into some platforms that provide the foundation of our existing uh, investments. First and foremost, biodiesel is by far our most important investment annually in the industrial space. This year, uh, we funded 12 new projects for 2021. Um, roughly 35% of all conventional soybean oil is used domestically to produce biodiesel or renewable diesel. This accounts for about 8 billion pounds of annual usage with growth expectations of an additional 4 billion within the next five to 10 years. Key 21 projects center around removing barriers to OEM expansion measuring the impact of NOx standards, California LCFS and low emissions testing that really drive new renewable diesel standards and securing approvals of B20 to expand that market for soy as an input. Additionally, we have new innovations driven by hyaluronic adoption, a new fatty acid that we're working with, which runs adjacent to the biodiesel investment with conventional oil. And uh, if you look at it this way, first you have the fuel that drives the truck, then the oil that lubricates the engine, followed by the foam seat that we use to remove uh, volatile compounds in the interior of the cab, and tires with soybean oil that better grip the road. In addition, this year we saw expansion actually into the road surfaces, soybean oil used uh, for road surface reconstruction in the form of asphalt and concrete. Uh, first to market 
is this product here with biosynthetic technologies, high-performing bio-based synthetic motor oil, used high oleic soybean oil, produced on U.S. farms, biosynthetic technologies, motor oil is also recognized as a USDA certified bio-based product in the United States Department of Agriculture's bio-preferred program. So you can use high oleic soybean oil as a lubricant. Uh, OEM manufacturers recognize this product along with U.S. military who tested it on conventional vehicles. So there's a 5W20 and a 5W30 available at any time, again, based on high oleic soybean. A recent success with a lot of potential is using high oleic in asphalt paving. The checkoff uh, partnered with Iowa State University and the Asphalt Paving Association of Iowa to make demonstrations possible on this technology. High oleic offers several new opportunities based on its unique fatty acid profile. The Biomag product that Iowa State starts with high oleic soy, then it moves to epoxidized soybean and then on to novel chemistry that creates new binding technology. Uh, this product will replace petroleum and allows for the use of an additional 15 to 30% reclaimed asphalt per mile uh, when uh, repaving uh, roads today. We basically have six tests running at Department of Transportation being run by those individual states. For two years in Alabama, we've had a test track down with over 6 million single axle loads driven over that. You see improved compression results, limited rutting, reduced cracking. Uh, again, I think culmination for this project will be a 130 mile stretch of highway done in Iowa this year to, to close out testing before we move on to full commercial production. Additionally, road services, we have a product called Pore Shield developed by Indiana Qualified State Soybean Board with financial assistance from USB. Uh, this product just doesn't sit on the surface of the road, but it penetrates the concrete surfaces, creating greater resistance to elements. And uh, key to this, this product is biodiesel in its normal state with polystyrene added to it. So it's a, a real uh, great invention that uses additional soy in an area that we want to use soy in which is biodiesel, could continue the innovation process. I'm gonna shift a little bit uh, to tires, thanks in part to Checkoff funded research. Goodyear discovered using soybean oil in place of petroleum resulted in a tire with better traction in wet and cold weather conditions. They launched two product lines, Eagle and Assurance brands that cover about 77% of all uh, car tires on, on the road today. Uh, greater flexibility, of the rubber, again, at cold temperatures, creates greater adhesion. Uh, you're looking to create efficiencies in manufacturing process in the form of reduced energy consumption, uh, less actual oil in the tire, and again, kicking out uh, petroleum that, that uh, harms the environment. So through checkoff efforts, Goodyear plans to replace all petroleum in their products, in their tire products, by the year 2040 globally. Uh, a nice increase we saw this year in, in soybean through innovation. Uh, we saw about a 25% increase in good years use of soybean just in 2020. And just to show you how innovation builds on innovation, that same rubber technology that's in the Goodyear tires has been transferred over to Skechers in a licensing uh, program Goodyear did with, with the folks at the Skechers program. They selected Skechers running shoes uh, are available for men, women, and children utilizing that Goodyear rubber technology that contains a special polymer that uh, again builds on adhesion in wet conditions and in colder conditions. So you can not only get your tires to stick to the road better, you can also get your gym shoes at this point in time. So it doesn't get much more exciting than that. So I want to conclude um, this uh, discussion real quickly with uh, by just indicating that there's really various forms for soybean, whether conventional or high oleic, uh, that can be used today, driven by innovation and new technologies. There's really over 1,000 industrial products out there that contain soybean oil uh, due to farmer investment and the innovation uh, from folks that are participating in, in this uh, discussion today. We see new opportunities and surfactants 
biodegradable plastics and batteries as next generation technologies that need to be developed and that will extend the volume of soybean being used. We want to continue the key partnerships with Biodiesel Board, Ford Motor Company, Goodyear, and universities across the United States, and great students like the ones you're going to hear from today that help drive growth and profitability for U.S. soybean farmers for decades to come. So with that, thank you for your time. I'm going to kick it back over to Jenna. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, we'll save uh, the majority of questions for the end, but we did have one come in. I'll uh, throw it at you now. Is there a future for high oleic soybean oil as an input for biodiesel? There, there actually is. So high oleic uh, is a high monounsaturated product, and it's lower in saturated fat, which just by having lower saturated fat indicates that it should be uh, a better product for creating biodiesel blends. The problem at this moment is that just it's a new innovation, so it's pretty hot and pretty expensive. But uh, as costs go down for this product and the volumes go up, we'll see a collapse in the overage structures and a better opportunity to supply high oleic into the biodiesel segment. Thank you. And uh, also, I'm sure I'm not the only runner with us tonight who wants to know where, I, where we can get those Skechers. You can get them at any, any place Skechers sells their shoes and, uh, or over the internet. Uh, they are identified by their premium technology which results from that uh, gripping Goodyear technology. Great to know. All right, thank you, John. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker who runs the National Biodiesel Board's office on the West Coast where climate programs are a substantial market driver for low carbon fuels like biodiesel and renewable diesel. He served as a longtime division chief of the California Air Resources Board, also known as CARB, and has overseen a number of CARB's key climate and air quality programs, including the Low Carbon Fuel Standard and Cap and, Tra Cap and Trade Program. He's a chemical engineer and a lawyer, so you could say he knows something about staying flexible and open in his career path. Floyd. Yeah, thanks, Jenna. Uh, let's see, share screen. Uh, see, um, someone has to let go of the, uh, the share screen. Okay, give us just a second here. There you go. Okay, um, thanks Jenna for uh, inviting me. I'm uh, really excited to uh, share this forum with such bright young scientists working in the biodiesel space. Uh, as you noted, uh, I have a science engineering legal and regulatory background prior to joining NBB. So I was asked to uh, talk a little bit about how uh, I got to this point and what insights that experience can provide these young scientists um, I'll then put some uh, context on the importance of the work that they're doing uh, and um, you know, talk about a little bit about why biodiesel plays such a vital role in connecting the dots between good science and good uh, policy, particu particularly in addressing climate change. So as you'll see in the next couple of slides, my career path, uh, which is uh, illustrated very accurately here, was relatively mundane and straightforward, uh, with each uh, stage leading to and informing the next step on that roller coaster uh, until I reached my ultimate goal of fame. We'll talk a little bit about that later. So like these next generation scientists, my college career was spent uh, being steeped in science, specifically chemical engineering. Uh, I focused on biochemical engineering and semiconductor processing because I figured those were the emerging industries at the time. Uh, unfortunately, both of those industries tanked by the time I approached my senior year. Um, which I'm sure a lot of people are fearful of that. Uh, so I switched gears and went into the traditional uh, petroleum refining uh, sector upon graduation. Um, that was fortunate for me because uh, that experience taught me a couple of important lessons. Uh, number one, uh, I, it taught me a lot about the importance of transportation fuels. Number two, 
uh, it taught me that I really didn't want to spend the rest of my life uh, in petroleum. Uh, and working at the refinery also exposed me to environmental regulations, uh, which attracted me to the California Air Resources Board. So as you mentioned, I, I was uh, at uh, CARB for over 32 years. Uh, the first third of that was as an engineer developing a number of new air pollution regulations on sources such as motorcycles, gas stations, and uh, electric vehicles. The second third of my state service uh, involved getting a law degree and working as a lawyer on a number of new regulations uh, on heavy duty trucks, commercial harbor craft, and ocean going vessels. Um, you might think those are two disparate uh, fields, but there's a lot of overlapping skill sets, particularly in the critical thinking and problem solving skills that both of those um, disciplines provide. And so that led me to the last third of my career at CARB, which is uh, managing and directing various climate change programs, several of which are uh, shown in this graphic. This final stage focused on transportation fuels and transportation, uh, which is the single biggest source of greenhouse gases and air pollution in California and many other states. More to the point, my work in directing these programs exposed me to the benefits of alternatives to petroleum, uh, such as biodiesel. Uh, to me, biodiesel is a prime example of how good science can inform and provide a solid basis for good environmental policy. Um, lots of good science, much of it developed by the National Biodiesel Board uh, with invaluable support from soybean growers and checkoff. Uh, fill the knowledge gaps that regulators like myself with an emerging uh, had with an emerging fuel like biodiesel and demonstrated the superior environmental uh, performance of biomass based diesel fuels. Examples of that good science are continuing improvements in life cycle carbon accounting that show reductions uh, up to 86% in carbon emissions and nearly 60% in particulate emissions and we'll talk about the importance of those. Uh, in a couple of slides. So by now, as you probably guessed, the fame I was refer referring to in that first slide isn't really the kind involving wealth or paparazzi, but of course is a reference to fatty acid methyl esters, also known as biodiesel. Uh, a little more seriously, I wanna take it uh, to a higher uh, level uh, in terms of the next few slides. I wanna put some uh, context into the importance of the work that uh, these um, next generation scientists are doing, not just, to the, not just for the biodiesel industry writ large, but more broadly to aggressive climate policies being implemented or considered um, in California, the, the West Coast, other states, and even internationally. So uh, using California as an example, a decade ago, uh, CARB uh, put into place an aggressive life cycle based regulation that you mentioned earlier. Uh, the low carbon fuel standard, and that was to reduce the carbon from transportation fuels in California. Over the next, uh, over the past 10 years, the low carbon fuel standard has sent a strong signal to the alternatives, alternative fuels market. Um, produce your lowest carbon fuel, send them to California, and the program will reward you with substantial market value for those fuels. Put more simply, petroleum, gasoline, and diesel generate deficits. Uh, under this program, while alternative fuels are lower carbon and generate credits that can offset those deficits. Um, I would note that while cellulosic ethanol on the gasoline side was expected to be the key source of carbon reductions in the LCFS, that reality never really came to pass. Uh, and instead, what really surprised us at CARB uh, was how biodiesel along with renewable diesel later on uh, really stepped up as the dominant source, uh, as a dominant force in the LCFS program. Here you can see the tremendous growth of biomass-based diesel during the 10 years the LCFS was in, is, has been in place, starting with only 14 million gallons in 2011. Uh, these sustainable diesel replacements have grown nearly 6,000% nearly since then, with 830 million gallons reported last year. Over the life of the program, over 3.3 billion gallons of uh, biomass-based diesel have been sold and used in California. That growth means that each year, a gallon of diesel fuel becomes increasingly lower carbon and more sustainable to the point where nearly a quarter of each 
a gallon of diesel fuel in California is comprised of biomass-based diesel. That's a remarkable success story, um, and we expect this trend to continue. Uh, here you can see the evolution of biomass-based diesel's role in the LCFS relative to other uh, alternative fuels. Uh, as you can see here, ethanol was the predominant alternative fuel at the start of the program, generating close to 80% of the LCFS carbon reductions. Fast forward uh, four short years and biomass-based diesel's superior performance and carbon score has enabled it to take over the lead from ethanol and it has kept that ever since. Uh, here you see that for the last two years, biomass-based diesel shown in blue generated nearly half of the LCFS carbon reductions and credits. That tremendous growth has resulted in a large number of credits generated last year. That was 6.7 million credits uh, with a value of about $1.3 billion. Uh, and that translates to about $1.50 per gallon of value uh, for the biomass-based diesel. But it's not just about economic benefits and it's not even just about climate change because uh, biomass-based diesel provides significant uh, public health benefits and those benefits importantly are available now, not years from now and certainly not decades from now, uh, but they are available now, uh, you know, they're, they're dropping uh, fuel replacements. Relative to petroleum diesel, biomass-based diesel reduces uh, particulate matter emissions by nearly 60%. Uh, carbon monoxide by nearly 30%, and it reduces to uh, emissions and other toxic or noxious compounds such as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. I would point out that uh, diesel exhaust uh, contains over 40 cancer-causing substances uh, and has been deemed a toxic air contaminant in California, so reducing the amount of diesel particulate matter is of high importance uh, to the state of California. The immediate public health benefits from using biomass-based diesel is especially important uh, for residents in uh, low-income and minority communities uh, in California. So these are the folks that have been, uh, California and elsewhere, these are the folks that have been historically uh, disproportionately impacted by high levels of air pollution. Uh, and these communities are generally the ones surrounding uh, high freight activity uh, facilities and locations such as ports rail yards, airports, and uh, logistics, um, uh, warehousing uh, distribution centers. And then moving forward, biodiesel can continue as the key uh, alternative fuel in the low carbon fuel standard to provide those substantial emission reductions while California and other states look to further decrease their um, petroleum dependence. That transition away from petroleum will likely take uh, many years and decades during which we expect um, biomass-based diesel to continue to serve that critical role in reducing emissions uh, from the heavy duty vehicle sector. Um, so that was a, a, a quick overview of the importance um, of biodiesel and the work that the uh, next generation scientists are doing. I, you know, I hope you saw from my experience that not only is the science that you're working on very important on its own, uh, but it can also provide you with the skill sets and the knowledge base to inform and establish uh, the robust basis for effective policies like the low carbon fuel standard. Uh, I wanna thank everyone for their attention. And I wanna wish all of the next generation scientists well as they continue trying to solve the number of the pressing issues that we face moving forward. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Floyd. Uh, if you have a question for Floyd, please go ahead and type it into your Q&A feature and we will try to get to as many of those as we can at the end. But now it's time to hear from our students, the new co-chairs of the Next Generation Scientists for Biodiesel. Our four new co-chairs bring diverse and promising research as well as exciting outreach experience to NGSV. Up first is Leo Booty. Leo. The fact that we are run almost entirely by undergraduate students uh, really allows us to foster a Hello, it is such a pleasure to be here. My name is Leo Booty. I am an undergraduate student of chemical engineering from the University of Kansas. 
I am a student leader of the KU Biodiesel Initiative at the university. And most recently, uh, I'm one of the most recent co-chairs for the Next Generation Scientists for Biodiesel. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I hope to tell you a little bit about the KU Biodiesel Initiative today. I'll start with who we are. We're a student-driven organization, uh, and that, that is really important because the fact that we are run almost entirely by undergraduate students uh, really allows us to foster a great culture of student leadership, of engagement, of hands-on problem solving. Um, we are founding members of the Kansas Biodiesel Consortium with other Kansas schools with biodiesel programs. We are sponsored by the Kansas Soybean Association, uh, to whom we owe a, a huge debt of gratitude. And we have a tradition of research, sustainability, and outreach, all of which is propagated by our student members. We live here at the Sustainability and Environment Center at the University of Kansas as part of the engineering school. We're in sunny Lawrence, Kansas, and uh, this building was opened just in 2012, so we have access to some really fantastic new facilities in which to do our work. Uh, we'll take a step inside. Here's our production space, and uh, while it may look a bit rudimentary at the outset, uh, it actually serves its purpose perfectly, and that is to be a highly accessible, highly modular system for producing biodiesel that can be run entirely by undergraduate students. All of our students to that point do all the maintenance, uh, they do all the operation, they do all the augmenting whenever we add a new component or a new unit to our process. Uh, it's done entirely by students, giving them exceptional hands-on learning experiences. We get to learn by doing and it helps us really understand the process better than most would be able to without having this sort of experience. Stepping over to our testing lab, um, this is one of the things that really makes our program unique, and that is that we have uh, very modern testing facilities. We have the capacity to do full ASTM D6751 testing. Um, we have all the necessary apparatus for all 19 necessary tests for that. Um, as a result, the students that come through our testing program learn how testing is done in the industry. As a result of that, we can produce extremely high quality fuels because we can hold ourselves to the same standards of quality that are held by uh, by uh, companies in the industry that produce fuels. Now I'd be highly remiss if I didn't spend uh, some time talking about my mentor, Dr. Williams. Um, I don't want to embarrass her, but suffice it to say she's one of the finest educators I've had the privilege of learning from. And when I say that she creates future leaders in the biodiesel industry, I do mean it literally. Um, I've had the great pleasure of meeting former students of hers who occupy now some of the highest levels of leadership in the biodiesel industry. Now, I hope to distill some of the lessons that I've learned with the KU Biodiesel Initiative and really bring those to the next generation of scientists for biodiesel to really take the next generation scientists to the next level. I think uh, there are hundreds, perhaps thousands of really exceptional students across the United States that we could engage with, we could bring to the NGSB and, uh, and who would make really fantastic students and really fantastic scientists for the next generation. Thank you so much for having me and have a wonderful day. Hello everybody. My name is Dennis Bendegar and I'm in the Anderson Lab at the University of Minnesota in Agronomy and Plant Genetics. And today I'll talk to you all about Pennycris, a potential cash cover crop with major environmental and financial benefits. But what is Pennycris? Pennycris is a member of the Brassicaceae family and is related to rapeseed and canola. We like it because we have the ability to make rapid genetic improvements in Pennycris due to its small genome size and simple genetics. It has very high oil content, as you can see, with 27 to 38% oil by weight and high uric acid content with 30 to 40%. This makes it very suitable for biodiesel and jet fuels. It also has very high natural yields of 1,000 to 2,000 kg per hectare. Now, my research at the University of Minnesota is focused on major productivity challenges in Pennycris. What I would really like to do is understand the genetics of seed and pot size and oil content in pennygrass. As you can see, the seeds of pennygrass are tiny with a thousand seed weight of only around 0.9 grams, which makes it really hard for farmers uh, for mechanical handling. And since we want to use it as a biodiesel and jet fuel resource, we really want to maximize the uh, oil content in pennygrass. Now, I would like to go on and say that pennygrass will not compete with any major food crops. It is grown in the off season in terribly harsh conditions and the high uric acid and glucosinolates make the natural oil not good for human consumption. However, it is a great source for uh, biofuels and jet fuels. 
but it will definitely provide many intensification benefits like increased yield or output per unit area. It'll allow us to diversify the crops on the landscape and provide many ecosystem benefits like nitrogen sequestration, pollinators, uh, food source, etc. Now, our breeding goals at the University of Minnesota for pennycress and soybeans are interconnected. In a sense, we are trying to create high yielding and high oil uh, pennycress for farmers. We are trying to develop intercropping studies with soybeans to facilitate sustainable agricultural intensification. We also want to contribute to the identification and development of soybean varieties specifically adapted to pennycress intercropping systems so we reduce any penalties on soybean while providing maximum uh, pennycress yields. Now, how would it look? This is an aerial view of soybean pennycress intercropping study. And as you can see on the top left, it's soybeans without the pennycress intercrop. And you can see that the soybean is growing happily and healthily. On the top middle, you can see that there is a lot of yellow intermixed with the green. Those are the mature pennycress with soybeans coming through them. Now, what it would look like close up is the soybeans that have been planted into the pennycress are germinating and growing happily from within the pennycress, as you can see in the picture here. Now, what I would like to finish with is saying that current agricultural practices have room to add a second crop to optimize land use. This is important because these crops provide important ecosystem services like erosion control, nitrogen sequestration, pollinator feed source, and many more. Pennycress is being evaluated as a winter annual cash cover crop because it is a financially viable and a sustainable source for farmers. And my research at the University of Minnesota seeks to understand the genetic basis of seed size and oil content to create high yielding, high oil, and soybean complementary pennycress. With that, I would like to thank my advisory committee and my members and my mentor and uh, my funding agencies. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Leo, and thank you, Zenith. Um, there's been a lot of interest in cover crops for all the environmental and soil health benefits that he mentioned, but having a cover crop that's also a cash crop for farmers and can be used for biodiesel, no less, is truly exciting. So I've been a Pennycrest fan for a long time, and it's great to, be, to hear about your research, Zenith. By the way, Zenith is also featured in a new online commercial. The National Biodiesel Board is running, so don't be surprised if he pops up on your screen again in the near future. All right, hopefully our attendees have been paying attention because it's time for our first pop quiz question. And this one does count for eligibility to win one of two $100 gift cards to Amazon. So which of the following is a benefit of growing pennycress? Grows in the off season and harsh conditions, reduces erosion and nutrient loss, potential cash crop with natural oil suitable for biodiesel, or all of the above are benefits. We'll give everyone a second here to answer. All right, and it looks like most people got the answer right. Of course, all of the above are benefits. So thanks again for participating and thank you to our first two students. Moving on to our next two students. Our next speaker has a fascinating look at the social cost of carbon weighed against the economic cost of tools we can use to reduce carbon, including biodiesel and renewable diesel. Jenny. Hello, my name is Jenny Frank. I'm a PhD student at SUNY ESF studying sustainable energy, and I'm presenting my research quantifying the comparative value of carbon abatement scenarios over different investment timing scenarios. And what this basically means is that we calculated both the financial and greenhouse gas emissions impacts of investing in a currently mature and commercialized biomass-based diesel pathway versus investing in a not yet fully commercialized um, an immature battery electric pathway for class eight heavy duty vehicles. Our study objectives were to calculate the comparative impact of investing um, in, in these different scenarios for class eight heavy duty fuel systems. And we looked at 
four different scenarios, a 100% petroleum diesel scenario, a biomass-based diesel scenario, and then two scenarios that take into account investment timing. So petroleum diesel to battery electric and a biomass-based diesel to battery electric scenario. We calculated the 20 year net present value, including financial costs and benefits, as well as the social cost of carbon. And the social cost of carbon is the cost of emitting one megagram of carbon dioxide equivalent. And to calculate this, we subtracted the annual emissions production of the, each comparative scenario from the annual emissions production of the baseline diesel, so the petroleum diesel scenario. And we multiplied that value by the social cost of carbon. As for the results, uh, scenario two achieved the highest net present value, which was the biomass-based diesel scenario. And scenario three achieved the lowest net present value, the petroleum diesel to battery electric scenario. In terms of cumulative emissions generated, scenario one, the petroleum diesel, accounted for the highest cumulative emissions, whereas scenario four, uh, the battery, the biomass-based diesel to battery electric scenario accounted for the lowest uh, cumulative emissions generated. In terms of the cumulative social cost of carbon benefit, the highest benefit was achieved for scenario four, the biomass-based diesel to battery electric scenario, and the lowest benefit was achieved for scenario one, the petroleum diesel scenario. So in conclusion, this study really highlights the significance of accounting for investment timing when you're looking at both the financial viability and the greenhouse gas emissions um, production of different decarbonization scenarios. And it also shows that when investment timing is considered, those scenarios that yield the highest annual greenhouse gas emissions reduction benefits do not always um, account for the largest net present value. And the study finds that the biomass-based diesel to battery electric scenario achieved the largest cumulative social cost of carbon benefit, and the biomass-based diesel scenario achieved the largest 20-year net present value. And this is very important for researchers, policymakers, and other interested stakeholders because um, both sides must be considered, both sides in terms of investing now in a currently mature and commercialized carbon abatement pathway, such as the biomass-based diesel pathway, versus investing later in um, a lower carbon pathway that has yet to reach commercialization, such as the battery electric pathway for heavy-duty trucks. So I want to thank you for listening, and I also want to thank the National Biodiesel Board for funding this project, and to all the co-authors for providing their support and technical expertise. Hi, my name is John Cramsey, and I am going into my senior year at Iowa State University, and I am studying chemical engineering. And so today, I want to tell you guys a little bit about a club that I'm president of uh, at Iowa State, and it's called Biobus. So Biobus, I would consider to be two main things. It's an engineering club on campus, but it's also an outreach program for the surrounding Ames community. And so I'll go into more detail on these two things. So first, I would say that it is an engineering club and what we do is no different than any other biodiesel refinery where we collect oil or some sort of waste material. We turn that into biodiesel and we give it back to be used in transportation of some sort. So collecting oil, uh, that first picture you see, that would be our super sucker as we call it. It's made out of a 40 gallon propane tank and uh, air compressor. And so we wheel that over to our cafeterias and we siphon out about 40 gallons of used vegetable oil at a time. And so then we wheel it back to our in-lab reactor, which is located in the biorenewables lab on campus. And from there, we make our biodiesel. Where, and so we do the same process that you would find in any other biodiesel refinery where we know how much oil we have. And from there, we can calculate how much methanol we need to use and how much catalyst we need to use with that as well. And so once we finish making our biodiesel and we separate that from the 
glycerin, we take the biodiesel and we give that to the cyride bus system. And so I'll tell you a little bit about the cyride bus system. It's really cool because the bus system doesn't only help us students uh, there on campus, but the bus system also helps everyone else in Ames as well. So while most of the buses do circulate around campus, the each line also has a little it goes a little ways out to the edge of town. And so it's a way that everyone in the Ames community is able to utilize these bus systems. And I think it's really cool that our club on campus is able to take a waste product that we make on campus. And we're able to turn that into a product that not only us students are able to utilize, but everyone in the entire Ames community is able to utilize. And so I said that Biobus also has a lot of, our, is starting an outreach program, uh, which is why I have one of my bullet points saying new initiatives. Biobus has been around since 2008, and about a couple years ago, we hit a lull where nothing really happened for three years, and so we're still trying to like get ourselves and dust ourselves off again from that. And so last year, we started our, our outreach program again. And so that's what our picture is right there on the slide. And since We've done a couple outreach programs last year. We're hoping to continue to build off of that and we're coming up with different ideas that we can do to kind of get, you know, more elementary students or high schoolers more engaged in learning about biodiesel and all of its good effects. And so we're hoping that as time continues to go on and we get more and more experience with talking to a younger audience and even college students, uh, we can continue to grow our outreach program. And so we're looking forward to that. And so that's pretty much it about biodiesel or biobus. And uh, I'd also like to make a quick shout out. So this past summer or this summer, I had an internship lined up, but unfortunately it got canceled. And so it got canceled at the last minute. So I reached out to a contact that I have at NGSB and I asked if they could help me to find a job. And they were able to help me find a position at AGP in Emmitsburg, Iowa, which is a soybean processing plant. And so I think it's really cool that I was able to use my contacts with NGSB and I was able to get a summer job. So um, thank you for all that. And also thank you for uh, listening to my presentation. All right, thank you, John, and thank you, Jenny. I wanna thank all of our new co-chairs and invite them and our other panelists to go ahead and turn their video back on and um, microphones. We'll get to questions in just a second. Um, but we had the pleasure of meeting all of these students in person at the National Biodiesel Conference and Expo. They came on a student scholarship program open to members of NGSB. This is a competitive travel scholarship. So we provide $600 to help cover travel to the event plus no cost registration. And students year after year just report having an exceptional experience learning about all aspects of the industry up close and networking with top biodiesel scientists from around the world. So right now we are still planning on an in-person conference January 18th through 21 in Fort Worth, Texas. We encourage students to apply from the NGSB website which you can find at biodieselsustainability.com. We also have a poster session where you can present biodiesel research or you can present on an outreach project like the ones Leo and John have. And uh, just a little insider tip, your application will earn more points if you apply to present a poster. So before we open up the floor to your questions, it's time for our last two pop quiz questions. So Jenny Frank's analysis accounts for a social cost of carbon benefit for the low carbon fuel systems. Her study concluded that when compared to battery electric as a pathway to decarbonization, biodiesel or biomass based diesel had the largest 20 year net present value. True or false? And we'll give you just a second to answer from your computer. All right, we can probably go ahead and close that. And we'll see how everybody did. 
And of course, the answer is true. So most people got that right. Well done. All right, we are going to go right into our next quiz question. And even though this one is for fun, we are uh, this one, this one counts towards the um, the two one hundred dollar gift cards. So in the series, The Flash, which character describes his or her biodiesel research project during the famous King Shark episode? And I'll give you a hint, this character was a college student at the time. All right, let's go ahead and close that. We'll see how everybody did. Ah, a few people got it right. It was actually Wally West. So um, definitely the second answer. Barry Allen, nice try. Um, yeah, so biodiesel has been mentioned in several pop culture uh, episodes on television, and that's one of my personal favorites. So now let's go ahead and open up the, the floor for questions. So if our panelists haven't um, turned on their microphones, go ahead and unmute yourselves. Um, so we've got a question for John at Iowa State. How do you manage quality control and making sure your campus biodiesel meets ASTM standards? So for quality control, uh, what we've done in the past is our setup isn't too terribly advanced. So we would just kind of measure the basic things like the moisture content within the biodiesel that we produce. However, uh, recently we've developed a partnership with REG and all of the samples that we make uh, will ship to them and they'll sample it for us and tell us the quality aspects of it. Okay, thanks John. Um, question for Zenith. Bringing an oil seed like Pennycrest to commercial viability has a lot of moving pieces. Does your university look at the whole picture in that respect or just your particular research? So we at the University of Minnesota are, uh, in, have been involved with Pennycrest for like seven to eight years now. And the goal is to domesticate it from a wild species. So when we're, when we're trying to introduce a new oil seed crop, what ends up happening is there are a lot of moving pieces. I am part of the breeding and genetics team, but I do collaborate with agronomists who are doing like all sorts of double cropping, intercropping studies uh, and agronomy studies. We also partner with agricultural economists to see what the potential financial benefits of Pennycrest is going to be. And even in our team at the University of Minnesota, we have uh, commercialization experts as well as supply chain experts who are looking to connect the consumers and the producers. So when we have a product ready, then it's, it'll be out in the fields and with uh, you know, biodiesel producers when we're ready. So it's a whole, holistic approach to uh, bringing an oil seed into the market. Yeah, it's fairly comprehensive and um, somewat unusual, I think, to, to, have some, to have that holistic of an approach to a project like this. Yep. Uh, yeah, we are dedicated to bringing perennials and winter annual crops, so crops that can grow in the winter. And the goal is to make, uh, so as we've heard from Borlaug, there was the green revolution that saved the wheat acres. What we're trying to do is called the Forever Green Initiative, where we're trying to grow crops throughout the year and not just in the summer, so. So while we're talking, we've had a couple other questions come in, um, two of them. First of all, why Pennycrest versus canola? And then what happens to the meal when you get the oil? So for the Pennycrest versus canola thing, one of the easiest answers I could probably give is, you know, in the upper Midwest, I'm in Minnesota right now and it's already in the 30s. So in the winters, we get minus 30s, minus 40s. So we need a plant that will survive the cold. And Pennycris, since it was a weed until like seven years ago, it is well, it is like well adapted to the Minnesota weather. So even in like really, really cold weather, it doesn't die. So since we are trying to make sure our farmers have the least possible problems in trying to grow this crop and not have any losses, then Pennycris is a better option to grow in the winter because of the harsh climate. In terms of the seed meal, in the natural state, uh, Pennycrest seed meal can be used 
uh, with the paralysis technique and uh, turned into aviation fuel, but that's in the natural state. But we at the University of Minnesota are also working on uh, various different projects where we take out the harmful products, harmful, harmful compounds in uh, pennycrest like uric acid and glucosinolates that make it like not good for human consumption. And we can, uh, for the seed meal purpose, the seed meal has around 32 to 35% protein. So we can harness that in the form of like animal feed or even for human consumption. So there are a lot of uses uh, for it. And I see the last question there as the commercialization aspect of it. Uh, there are technologies uh, being built at the University of Minnesota that are uh, going towards these things. Like uh, Minnesota just had their first penny press patent uh, last month, basically. So there are things moving into commercialization and we do have a commercial partner in St. Louis. So yeah, I think that'll all right. cover all of the questions. Thanks, Senna. Thank you. A couple questions in for Leo. Um, first of all, how do you filter your used cooking oil? That's an excellent question. Thank you so much for asking it. Um, and I love that question because I am highly interested in the process side of, of biodiesel production. Uh, and that's kind of where, where I began learning in the process. Um, and, and I'll tell you, our, our process is fairly simplified. Our filtration consists of heating the oil to lower viscosity, and then we use gravity filtration um, through um, a set of, of strainers. Um, it allows us to get um, very decent filtration down to about uh, 10 micron particulate size. Um, now we're, we're always looking to, uh, you know, improve, uh, you know, and expand our process. So we're, we're looking at some, at some pressurized filtration methods. We're looking at um, some vacuum uh, filtration methods, but what we've got, you know, we, we kind of have a very, uh, if it ain't broke philosophy in our program. So, you know, it works great for us. And um, another question, do you use biodiesel at the university? Um, I think you covered that, but maybe yeah, absolutely. And I'm happy to talk a little bit more about it because it's, it's a point of pride for us in our program. Um, from our program's inception, it's been a feedstock to tailpipe uh, initiative. And, and the point being that we, we get our waste uh, cooking oil that we use as our feedstock on campus from our campus cafeterias. We convert it into high quality biodiesel fuel. We do all the testing to make sure that it meets ASTM uh, D6751 uh, standards, and then we use it in our own facility services, um, and it's a, a great credit to um, uh, Mr. Floyd Vergara's point about uh, the efforts in the National Biodiesel Board encouraging OEM, you know, compliance with biodiesel compatibility, um, because most of our facility services, our lawnmowers and the equipment that's used on campus is OEM compatible with up to B20 fuel, so we're allowed to blend it um, into B20 fuel that they can use. And uh, this would be a question for Leo or, or perhaps John. Um, how, how can other universities replicate this? How, how did your biodiesel initiatives first come into being and how can other campuses do something similar? John, you wanna take the lead? So our biodiesel initiative came into practice around 2008. Uh, I think it was started by a grad student and a couple of his uh, college associates and so um, I suppose for other schools that are wanting to start up a uh, club similar to what me or Leo have we, they could uh, probably you know talk to a professor or like you know some sort of advisor who would be okay with like sponsoring them and talk to the university about like getting enough funds to build a basic reactor um, it's not a terribly expensive endeavor so it shouldn't be too terribly difficult and, and i'll just chime in on that point as well um we at, at the university of kansas are incredibly blessed to have the um the financial support of the kansas soybean commission and um you know much, much to um the credit of, of the united uh, soybean board uh that um checkoff programs do work and they they you know they enable us to do what we do through uh, the Kansas Soybean Commission. Um, we were able to get started. They enable us to keep doing what they're, we're doing and uh, they enable us to keep uh, expanding our program, reaching out and, and promoting growth at schools that don't yet have biodiesel programs. Yes, we thank them for their support for sure. Um, question for Jenny, will you be building on future research? What is phase two of your project? Yeah, thank you. 
So um, phase one, we really didn't focus at all on cumulative emissions, um, cumulative greenhouse gas emissions that come from um, heavy duty trucks, class eight heavy duty trucks. So that will be a large part of phase two of this analysis um, to really build on what we've done, um, taking similar scenarios, taking a similar methodology, but in including a cumulative aspect to it. All right, thanks, Jenny. A uh, question for John Jansen. What goes into working with a company like Goodyear? How, how do you um, convince a, a major company like that to incorporate soy? It's, it's almost all built around sustainability and conversations on uh, the environment. So in, in those cases, uh, actually, so many of these corporations have large programs uh, to improve their footprint that uh, the conversations flow pretty freely. Okay, um, question for Floyd. And uh, so, so Floyd, I think you've seen this question. We, we had one come into the panelists and basically, if I could just recap, it's, it's basically what took, what's taken CARB so long to recognize biofuels as a, a viable uh, solution to, to carbon? Um, yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, I don't, I don't know that they don't recognize it. Uh, I mean, you know, as I showed in my slides, it, it's almost half of the, the success of the low carbon fuel standard. So you'd have to be pretty blind not to see the role that uh, biofuels and biodiesel and renewable diesel in particular uh, play in this program. Um, I, I think that the question that I, I think this is from Mark Rausch. Uh, it's a great question. It, it touches on the um, how enamored uh, the state agencies in California uh, are with the, the bright and shiny of electric vehicles and electrification in general. Um, I think there is a, a significant role for that technology in the light duty passenger vehicle sector. Um, in the heavy duty vehicle sector, uh, you know, they're making efforts to electrify that, but uh, I mean, that is a whole different ball game. Uh, many different uh, duty cycles, uh, different classes of engines and vehicles. You have significant, uh, you know, you have significant uh, in-state fleet and you have a very significant uh, fleet going through the state, uh, interstate uh, traffic. So it's a much more complicated um, uh, question with regard to the electrification of heavy duty vehicles and um, you know I, I think what it boils down to is um, really it's a gamble right there's a, a whole bunch of ifs that would have to occur for electrification and heavy duty uh, to succeed I mean you have to have um, substantial battery improvement uh, technologies and uh, improvement you have to have a substantial uh, public investment in infrastructure charging, uh, the, the charging uh, infrastructure, uh, as well as the power grid. Uh, and then you have to have the significant cost reductions coupled with um, public subsidies, because these electric vehicles in the heavy duty uh, side of things are very expensive. And so that's a lot of different ifs to occur. And the question is, do you gamble your entire future on that? and forego the immediate benefits that you could be providing, which the, the comment made um, for the public, especially in the disadvantaged communities where there's a lot of these trucks. Uh, do you forego that? Is that a, is that a really fair and ethical uh, thing to do? So I, I think, you know, it's, you know, the, the onus is on us to do the, the education, to talk to the folks that are being impacted by this. I think there's a substantial line of question and research along what Jenny was talking about uh, with respect to social cost of carbon, but I would frame it as a social cost of diesel particulate matter because, uh, you know, uh, reductions occurring in the near term in diesel PM is going to get get you a lot more benefit from a health standpoint than getting those reductions 20, 30 years from now. So I think there's a number of different facets here. We are working on it. It's a very important question. I, I, I love the fact that it was that it was asked. Uh, yeah. And there was, a, there was one last part in there saying, what was my role at CARB? Um, I, you know, I'm happy to say I was one of the few people who uh, 
argued against putting all the eggs in the um, electrified basket. So uh, I, did, I did push for an all of the above, particularly on the heavy duty side of things, uh, seeing that um, biomass based diesel was playing such a, a good role and having those immediate uh, public health benefits. So. Yes, and we're so grateful you were successful in that effort, Floyd. Um, but but what you you talked you you just mentioned how how this really fits with Jenny's research. So I, I want to give her a chance to comment on that. And um, also a question came in asking about why your research is or how it fits in with the the fight against global warming. Why it's important. So yeah, thank you. So. Um, I think the timing aspect is really important, as Floyd was mentioning, the investment timing of investing, at least for class eight vehicles, which is what my research only focused on class eight vehicles. We didn't look at any other classes or any other light duty vehicles or passenger vehicles. So um, it's really important to look at um, what happens when we invest now in a pathway that is mature and commercialized, like a biomass-based diesel pathway versus what happens when we may be in five years down the road in a battery electric um, pathway. And one of the scenarios we modeled was continuing a business as usual case of petroleum diesel for class eight heavy duty vehicles until from 2020 to 2025, and then switching over to um, a battery electric heavy duty vehicle. So we would sell the old vehicle and we would purchase a new um, battery electric vehicle. And that showed that it didn't have as much as a, a benefit in terms of production, in terms of um, uh, finances as some of the other scenarios that we modeled. So it's really important to pay attention to what's available now versus um, what happens when we wait, um, because it's an immediate effect, climate change. It's not going away and we have to take into account what we have now. Okay, uh, another question for, for John Jansen that I th think you would like to answer. We see the price of avocado rising due to increased consumption of avocado oil. Will soybean or vegetable oil prices go up as well because of asphalt or tire applications? Uh, the footprint of soy is a little larger than avocado. Um, you know, we're on 89 million acres. Uh, with another 20 million that could be brought into production. Uh, you're also looking at substantially large uh, crops in larger than the U.S. and Brazil, uh, currently in Argentina. So globally, I don't think there's any concern um, year to year. There are obviously impacts brought on by weather and end use and consumption, but uh, there's really very few crops large enough to supply the kind of footprint that the biodiesel folks need in order to supply, uh, you know, corn for ethanol and soybean, at least at that 50% rate um, is, is something that we continue to, to shoot for. Right, and of course, the, the case with biodiesel is that the soybean oil is a co-product from, from, of the meal, which is the main driver for value and food production. So it's it's basically using a, a co-product or a byproduct for biodiesel production. Yeah, well well said. I, I started my few slides with the, the increase middle class driving protein consumption uh, globally, which again is going to have a high demand for that meal, which forces oil into an overcapacity position. So right. more than I did. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question for Zenith, and you, you've, you've touched on this, but this is, must be one you, you get a lot. How, how long? How long until Pennycrest is commercialized? Uh, we don't know yet. So I don't think I can give a number, but we do have like, you know, statewide trials and interstate trials going on right now. The Pennycrest breeding team is collaborating with a lot of schools in uh, Illinois, like Western Illinois University, Illinois State. We have commercial partners in St. Louis. So we're trying to do it as fast as we can, but we need to make sure like everything is in order. So we're trying to domesticate a whole new crop. So we're thinking that hopefully uh, in the next five to 10 years, we'll have something that's ready for farmers, however much they want, whenever they want it. But like I said, you know, Wheat, barley, maize, soybean it took like 10,000 years and we're trying to do it in 10 years. 
the domestication process. So it takes a little bit, but hopefully in the next five to 10 years. All right. That's a conservative yeah. estimate. Yeah. Five to 10 years, okay. Well, can, can we quote you on that? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, everything takes takes longer than you want it to or think it should with science, right? But yes. it's that way for a reason, as we're finding out. Um, John, or a question for Leo as well, while we're um, just about to wrap up here, um, what challenges have you had to overcome at your processing facilities? John, you want to lead on that? Uh, okay, so for us at Iowa State, challenges that we have to overcome is one, finding the time to actually get into the lab to, you know, work on the biodiesel. Uh, the lab that we operate in has a limited time space just because of the building that it's in. And so because of that, that mixed with student schedules, it's kind of difficult to get people into the lab all the time. Uh, another problem is that our reactor is pretty old and it seems like every time we get it ready to run, something else kind of breaks down. And so it's just kind of fighting against time on that as well. So I'd say currently those are the two biggest challenges that we face here at Iowa State. And yep. I can definitely agree with with part of that point. Uh, you know, especially at uh, in KU Biodiesel Initiative, being um, a totally student run organization, um, it's it's a very double edged sword. Uh, uh, the 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 upside of it is uh, the University of Kansas is training and producing you know a fantastic talent pipeline for 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 both the local and the national biodiesel industry. I mean, there's really talented students coming out of this with a strong interest and, and a great skill set for working in the biodiesel industry. Um, but, but the con is that um, our program at the university is constantly recruiting and training new students. And, and so we're always constantly learning and we're, we're trying to build up a very strong uh, institutional knowledge retention so that as new students come into our organization, um, you know, they're building on the successes of the students before them. And I could say uh, personally that, that, that I stand on the shoulders of giants in my program, and, and I hope to leave a very good legacy for, for the folks that come after me. Yes, having continuity is, is a challenge we experience within the NGSB program because it, it doesn't take very many years for uh, a program to go away if there aren't students or professors who carry that forward. So um, we're, we're grateful to those schools who, who find a way to, to keep it going and bring up the next generation. So this has been great discussion. We're a little over time, but we appreciate participants sticking with us. I uh, wanna thank all of our panelists, our new co-chairs um, for joining us tonight, as well as our participants. We will notify the winners via email of the two gift cards. We did have uh, quite a few people who got uh, all the questions right. So uh, we also want to thank the United Soybean Board for supporting today's event. So thank you, John. And um, as you exit, please take our brief survey. We would appreciate if you take 30 more seconds to answer it. And that does play a role in our future funding of these programs. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Thanks.